So we can use these topographic maps to start measuring the size of these waves in the jet stream and the frequency with which large waves happen. So you remember I mentioned um, blocks in the atmosphere earlier. This is something that people have been studying for a long time. So what happens is, here we have um, Spain and, and England here. This, a block in the atmosphere is when you get such a big wave forming that sometimes it cuts off an eddy in the atmosphere. So you get this circulation um, going around all by itself. So this is an example of a, of a block that happened um, in March of 2012 over Europe, and it caused uh, an extreme heat event that time, uh, in that year. But what we are finding is that we know blocks cause a lot of extreme events because they're called blocks because when they occur, the atmosphere tends to get stuck. And that's, you know, it blocks all the weather patterns from changing. But what we're finding is that many of the extreme events that I showed you in the beginning weren't associated with blocks at all. They were associated with big waves in the jet stream. So this is the case of um, the heat wave in Vermont that I showed you earlier, where we had this big dip over the west and a big northward swing over the east, letting all that tropical air extend all the way north. Here's another case for a flooding event in Spain. There's Spain right there. And you see, again see this big wave in the jet stream bringing a lot of moisture off the Atlantic into Spain. That record snow in Japan I showed you. Here's Japan right here. Again, a very large wave in the jet stream, but no block. And here's the polar vortex again, showing you the big um, northward swing or ridge over the west coast, contributing to California's drought last winter, and the big southward dip or trough over um, the eastern third of the country. So again, no block. So we've changed our sort of approach here. So instead of looking at these blocks that people have been looking at for a long time, we're instead trying to measure just extreme waves in the jet stream. To do this, we're taking a very simple approach. And that is to look at these topographic lines again and pick out the one that's typically in the heart of the jet stream, where these lines are very close together. And then just very simply, every single day, measure the maximum latitude and the minimum latitude that we find in any given region. And keep track of how often that happens, how often it exceeds some large value. In, case, in our case, we're using 35 degrees of latitude. So whenever we get a case where the maximum minus the minimum is larger than 35 degrees, we call that an extreme wave. And that's something we can measure every single day, wherever you want. And what are we finding? Well, around the whole northern hemisphere in fall, and you'll notice that I'm focusing on fall a lot because that's when Arctic amplification is the strongest, this green line is showing us the frequency of those very wavy patterns when those waves are larger than 35 degrees. This is around the whole northern hemisphere. And what you see is there's a big uptick in the frequency of these very large waves in the jet stream. Together with that is the change in the speed of the winds that I showed you before. You can see that the winds and the, and the frequency of these waves um, is very closely related to each other. We can focus in on just the North Atlantic because this turns out it's one of the areas where Arctic amplification is the strongest in all seasons. And what we see is that there's an even more significant increase in the frequency of these large waves along with the decline in the westerly winds. So there's this strong evidence suggesting that these very wavy patterns are in fact increasing. But we can look at them all around the northern hemisphere and that's what I'm showing you here. So these are all the different regions. We've got the Atlantic over North America, over Europe, over Asia and the Pacific and the whole northern hemisphere for all four seasons. And these numbers here are showing you the percentage change in how often these wavy patterns have happened between these two periods of time. So this is the recent uh, 18 years or so compared to the early part of the record. So these numbers are big, especially in the fall. These are percent changes. So in the Atlantic and North America, for example, we're seeing like 50% increase in the frequency of these very wavy patterns. 
So it looks like the fall is really important. The summer, we're also seeing big increases, and the increases are largest in the Atlantic and North America. So I also, we also are not ignoring these blocking situations because they have received so much attention in the past. And this is one measure of how often these blocking patterns have been happening as well, comparing an early part, early uh, decades here to the more recent time. So this is the distribution of how often these have happened in the past versus what, they've, what they're doing more recently. So we're seeing this shift in the frequency of these blocking events occurring um, more often in recent times. So that agrees with what we found for the extreme waves. So I just quickly want to talk about some other very recent work that's come out that other people have done, looking at this very interesting phenomenon of, in fact, cooling happening. These are trends in surface temperature over Eurasia, or Asia. And this is for the winter time, so this is for the last um, 23 years or so. We've seen this very persistent cooling over Asia. And at first it was a real puzzle, and people there were saying, wait, you know, global warming? Wait a minute, it's been really cold here. It's been getting colder and colder. What the heck's going on? So uh, several people have been working on this um, very interesting observation. And what they found, both through uh, analyzing observations and analyzing um, the situation using various types of models, is that this area up here, where the, a lot of sea ice has been lost, um, has a big influence on the weather downstream. Now let me see if I can explain what's been happening. So we've, got, we've lost a lot of ice in this area. It's caused a lot of warming to occur there. That causes the layers of the atmosphere to bulge, like I told you before, bulge upward. And so that creates what we call these ridges in the jet stream. So it's causing the jet stream to take an extra swing northward. When that happens, down at the surface here, you tend to get high pressure forming. And the circulation around a high brings that cold Arctic air down over Asia. And that not only brings snow and cold, but it also makes the jet stream dip farther south in that area. When that happens, the jet stream is wavier. It creates this larger wave, and that wave energy actually gets transferred up to the upper levels of the atmosphere where the stratosphere is, and causes it to get wavier as well. This is the real polar vortex, actually. It's this upper stratospheric circulation of air that only happens in the winter. So we're seeing this waviness that starts with the ice loss causing the real polar vortex in the stratosphere to get wavier, and that then re-transmits uh, that wave energy back to the jet stream, so we see an even wavier jet stream later in the winter. Now this mechanism has been studied by now four different studies. Another one just came out that's going to be published on Sunday, all looking at this exact same mechanism completely independently. They didn't know each, they were each looking at it and studying it. They all used different methods and they all found the same mechanism. So I think it's pretty clear that this is something that we can hang our hat on. Coincident with this, we're seeing changes over the, over the northern hemisphere continent. So over the land, we're seeing, this is the coldest daily minimum temperatures, okay? So starting in the 1950s, over land areas, we were starting to see that temperature increase because of increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But just recently, as the sea ice has disappeared and as Arctic amplification has kicked in, we see this number is going down. So the minimum temperature over the continents has decreased. Along with that, the number of days over the continents uh, below freezing has increased. Same thing, it was starting to decrease because of global warming basically, but most recently we're seeing an uptick. And we're also seeing an increase in the areas of land with cold winter months. So this is all adding up to the same thing. So I'm going to wrap up now and just look at some, some more individual extreme events. And now that you all know everything there is to know pretty much about jet streams, this will all start to make sense. So first of all, we had record snows in Alaska in the winter of 2012 and record cold. What did the jet stream look like then? 
Well, this is the actual measurement of the jet stream. Jet stream. So here's Alaska, here's California. This gray here is like the red colors in the animation that I showed you. Like once again, we see this very large waves. The, the uh, wind currents here are bringing a lot of moisture in from Alaska. But because of all this cold air that's, allowed to, that's on the north side of the jet stream, that's the perfect recipe for heavy snow. Those, uh, that flooding event in Spain I showed you, same kind of a situation. Here's Spain. Here we are over in Detroit here. Again, a very, very wavy jet stream bringing a lot of moisture in from the Atlantic right into Spain. And the, both of these patterns were in place for weeks. Go back just two years to March of 2012, we broke literally thousands of high temperature records. This is pretty much bullseye right on Detroit. Those red colors there are showing you the temperatures that are warmer than average. Then this past winter was just the opposite. Those colors are showing you where it's colder than average. So now you know what the jet stream has to do with this sort of a thing, so you can probably imagine what it looks like. In March 2012, we had this big southward dip over the west, big northward swing over the east, allowing all that warm air to come right up here into Detroit. But the very same, but the very two, two winters later, we had a very similar situation, but the wave was in a different place. So instead of having the trough ridge, we had just the opposite situation leading to the opposite temperature patterns. And if we zoom in, or zoom out now, I should say, on this past winter, here we have North America again here, and this big southward dip in the jet stream that created the very cold winter, along with the big ridge over uh, California. If you look around the whole northern hemisphere, this white line here basically outlines the position of the jet stream. And you see that the, the colors are showing you where it's warmer than normal. So there's a lot of places where it's warmer than normal. Think back to the Olympics in Sochi and how much trouble they were having keeping snow there for the skiers. That's because of this big ridge that was in the jet stream. But you can see how contorted it was. And it was very, very persistent. In fact, just looking back last week, this is what the jet stream looked like. Again, big ridge over the west, big trough over us, basically, which led to the very cool September that we had and you had here. So this is what has been called the ridiculously resilient ridge. That's this ridge over California. It's why it's been so dry there, and it's not projected to go away anytime soon, at least not on a long-term basis. OK, so wrapping it up, we know the Arctic is warming very fast we see that the changes in the thickness of that layer of atmosphere are increasing faster there than the rest of the northern hemisphere. This is leading to weakening of those upper level westerly winds. And when that happens, we know that the jet stream tends to take these much wavier paths as, they, as it travels around the northern hemisphere. This can lead to some very unusual weather conditions, some very persistent weather conditions that can cause extreme events like heavy snows, flooding, droughts, heat waves. But there's a lot of other stuff going on in the climate system. The Arctic change is not the only game in town. We know the oceans are warming. So there's a lot of other factors that could be contributing to these changes in extreme events as well. This is another really active area of research. Um, how does the change in the Arctic relate to changes in other things that are happening in the climate system? But there is some good news in all of this, and I always, you know, this is pretty, pretty bad news for the most part, but I like to end on a happy note. And that is that the public is really noticing there's something going on. The conversation is changing. The media is all over this story connecting weather patterns with climate change. And we're starting to hear even politicians start to talk about this potential link to climate change. So, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that these guys that have been hanging out in this bunker are running out of ammunition. And they're not going to have much to say much longer. So on that note, I want to thank you again for having me. It was a real pleasure to come to Wayne State, and I'd be happy to answer any questions anybody has. <laughs>